Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here, welcome back to the railway and welcome to another review. Up to date I've got a Hornby Tender engine that I've never covered, so I'm pretty excited about this. Today's class of locomotive is the same class as on my first ever review, so this is kind of special to me. Um, my first review though was of an old mainline loco, I've never had a modern version of today's class. And the class is this, it is the Hornby Royal Scott locomotive, and I've wanted to try one of these for absolute years but I never have done simply because the price seemed ludicrous to me. So the RRP for these on Hornby.com is £170.99. So obviously that's a lot of money. And from the retailers, this is available for around £150, sometimes a little bit less if you're lucky. Now I'm absolutely fine with high prices as long as the product reflects that price, as long as the product matches that price in terms of its detail, performance, quality, all of that good stuff. Now this loco is from 2007, 13 years old. Is this model going to match that modern price tag? I'm not sure, I'm gonna need some convincing, I think. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I managed to get mine for £97.99, as you can see there, which is a lot more like it. That is my kind of price, and that is more what you'd expect for a loco that is 13 years old. However, I'm going to keep an open mind today. We will see what this is like. If you too want to check these out, I will include an affiliate link to Hatton so that you can see the different versions of this model on offer. For now, though, let's do this together. Let's find out what this is like, and fingers crossed, I will actually be pleasantly surprised by this one. Here's hoping, here we go. All right, so I mean, yeah, if this was a brand newly tooled model from Hornby or something like that, I would certainly not be surprised at the 170 pound price tag. Firstly, because the initial cost of a new tooling is incredibly high, so that would justify the cost in my opinion. But also the fact that, you know, 2020 Hornby models tend to have a bit of die cast on them. The quality is pretty darn good. I don't think they were doing die cast and that kind of thing back in 2007. So, yeah, I do have limited expectations at the moment, which maybe is unfair. However, it's looking pretty good to start with, isn't it, on the front of the box? Yeah, the loco looks beautiful. Really, really does. In the BL green, as you can tell. More specifically, though, let me show you which version I went for. So, mine is R3558 Late BR Royal Scott class. I think, does that mean it? Would be rebuilt possibly uh, it is the ranger and it is the 12th london regiment number 46165 so that is the version i went for and for just less than 100 pounds it seems pretty decent actually doesn't it like i say definitely more like it in my opinion okay the back of the box then here we go so you can see it was classified as a 7p so a very powerful locomotive for its size i think for the lms the royal scots were quite revolutionary weren't they in the centre, there's a brief history. Feel free to pause and read that as always if you'd like to. And then on the far end here, you've got Hornby's diagrams dated, as I say, 2007. So getting on a little bit. However, some of Hornby's models from 2007, I think, was it the A3 or A1 that was also from that year? They're very nicely detailed, quite plasticky though. And uh, I think if I remember correctly, they're prone to warping running plates. So Man, fingers crossed we're not seeing anything like that with this. Right, well, I've not had this unpacked yet, so I could keep waffling all day. I mean, I can do that, you know, I've learned to do that, but I could just open the thing and save ourselves a lifetime of frustration. I think I'll do that. I'm quite excited, actually. Like I say, it's not it's not that often that I find a, a sort of model that I've never actually owned before, or at least never seen before. I don't think I've seen one of these, or at least handled one in the flesh. There we are, so it's kind of hidden, as you can see in the packaging, so not revealing too much right now. Let's get this out then and uh, answer all those questions I have about this. Okay, so we have stuck to the back here an operating and maintenance guide, presumably. Let's have a look. Royal Scott and Patriot class, so does that mean they use the same chassis? Possibly. All right, let's have a look, see if this reveals anything about that. All right, so straight away, can't see anything really of the mechanism, so I might just have to remove the body to see that. Bit about lubrication then, fitting the accessories. This is very, very standard stuff. Body removal, well, that's good, so I'll be doing that later on. You can see that this has been upgraded, presumably, to have space for a speaker in the tender, and also you've got the 8-pin DCC socket there. It'd be nice if Hornby did a, a TTS version of this, wouldn't it? Anyway, on the back, brake rods. So that's that's all standard stuff. Yeah, it's very, very similar. We've seen it a thousand times before for different locos, haven't we? Right, come on then, let's have a look at this. And I'll spot with the detail bag, as I often do, and see what we've got inside there. It doesn't look too populated, this detail bag, so 
hopefully most of the details on the loco already. So it looks like cylinder drain cocks, you've got some vacuum fittings, a few steps, front coupling, and of course those brake rods that we saw on the instructions there. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's standard enough, isn't it? Right, come on then folks, what do we think? Die cast, no die cast? I'm gonna go for no die cast, but hopefully it'll have a big bulky chassis, which brings up the weight. Weight's all right so far, it's hard to tell. It doesn't seem particularly heavy, but not particularly light either. Here we go. Whoa. The uh, plastic tissue came off there in quite a dramatic fashion. All right. I mean, the finish isn't too bad, actually, is it? I mean, with the plastic bodies, sometimes they can look a bit dull and plasticky. This one's got a fair sheen to it, actually, uh, which I wasn't necessarily expecting. That's all right. Come on, then. Let's lift this out and see what this is like. All right. OK. So, yeah, I mean, there is there is quite a bit of weight to this. Yeah, it doesn't feel dreadfully light at all. Not at all. Uh, it feels very fragile, I must say. I can hear things clicking already. <laughs> but uh, yeah, hopefully that will be okay. What's this dangling off on front here? Is this a loose pipe? Yeah, well, it's not connected to anything, so it's got to be loose, hasn't it? Ooh, I, I feel nervous. I feel nervous about holding this. Yeah, I can see a few bendy parts. The whistle seems to have smelt something and is bending its nose up to try and sniff it. No metal construction either. I can see we've got some metal details. We'll come to these later on. But uh, yeah, the running plate, body, what you like. It's all made of plastic, I think. Bit puzzling for the price, but the level of detail seems to be up there, doesn't it? Very much so. So we'll take a close look at this shortly. But first of all, here's a little bit of history on the beautiful Royal Scott class. So the Royal Scott was a class of 70 locomotives introduced to the LMS in 1927 to the design of Henry Fowler. Up until this point, the LMS, like the Midland Railway, had maintained a fleet of much smaller engines, such as the Midland Compound and the Clawton class, but by the late 1920s, Fowler decided that these were inadequate, and he proposed a brand new Compound Pacific Express locomotive. Now, other departments in the LMS company opposed this suggestion, they didn't like it, and they borrowed a 460 Great Western Castle class for testing purposes from the Great Western, and that proved itself, I think. I think that was quite impressive to them, quite successful. And so Fowler's Pacific idea was rejected and the 460 Royal Scott design was born instead. And in fact, it would be another six years before a Pacific design would actually be approved. So back to the Royal Scots, the class was introduced without testing. So I don't know if it was very successful to start with. And certainly a lot of modifications were made on the fly. They were changing different parts, swapping smoke deflectors, that kind of thing. But apparently the class eventually became fairly successful. In 1943, all members of the class were rebuilt with a new Type 2A boiler, as seen on the rebuilt Jubilee class, which brought them up to modern standards, I think, a little bit. And withdrawal took place over the early 1960s, and all but two examples were scrapped. And obviously, because they were all rebuilt, neither of those two preserved examples are in the original Royal Scot condition. So some manufacturers like to attribute, at least partially, the recent increases in price to increased labour costs. Well, if that's the case with this model, I think Hornby, or rather Hornby's customers, need to ask for some of their money back, because whoever assembled this did a really bad job. In fact, I would say that this has actually been quite carelessly assembled. So let's take a look at some of this then. So I think this is the lubricator on the running plate. That is not fitted properly. Look at the way that stands proud. That is not particularly realistic. I mean, here it looks like somebody slipped with a tool because there's a big gouge out of the boiler, which is not just dirt or something. I've rubbed at that and it's not coming off, so that's permanent. I've already mentioned the whistle, which is noticeably bent upwards, not particularly good. You've got the loose pipes as well, just underneath the running plate, which are not connected to anything, so that can't be right. And then you've got this lamp iron here, which looks like it's being distracted because it's facing away from us, which is also quite noticeable. The model is also rife with glue marks. Whoever assembled it used far too much glue. Look at the splashes. They are glinting from a long way away because of all the glue used. Uh, the smoke deflectors are the same. Look at all the glue underneath those. It's oozing out from under several details. The handrails as well behind the firebox. You can see that there's glue oozing out from there. Look at this. I don't know if this is glue or just a bit of bad moulding on the side of the cab, but that caught my eye straight away as well. Now, if I'd paid £170 for this or 150 or whatever it is, I don't think I'd be very happy. In fact, I'm not dreadfully happy having paid just less than 100 for this. 
if models are gonna be this expensive, and I sound like a broken record because I seem to be saying this every week these days, but if models are gonna cost that much money, if customers are gonna pay that money, the manufacturers need to invest some of that massive amount of money into quality control, or I don't know, possibly training to ensure that those actually assembling the models know how to do it. Well, it's not all bad news though, because as you can probably tell, the level of detail on the model is absolutely fantastic. And well, well, the build quality is a bit naff. Some aspects of the quality are really quite good. For instance, you've got these actual metal safety valves and not just plastic like the whistle is, hence the reason they're straight, I suppose. And that's not the only separately fitted metal piece as well. You've got this high shine reverser. I'll try and find a little bit of a shot of a reverser that's made of plastic for comparison. But as you can see, the difference there is very, very noticeable, which is great. You've got the nameplate here, the Ranger, which looks like it is just tampo printed, but it is etched. It's a metal piece that, which is really quite nice. As I've already said, the boiler, the running plate, most of the body of the Loco is just made of plastic, which is a little bit of a shame from a quality perspective, but as far as weight goes, the Loco and Tender are very, very heavy. They weigh in at 371 grams, which is actually more than the Backman Patriot, despite it having the die-cast running plate. So weight is definitely not a problem. It's actually quite heavy to say that there's no metal on the bodywork besides some of the details. So let's take a look at some of the details then. Well, let's start with decoration. The actual decoration is superb. Look at the lining on the boiler there. I really can't fault it. Even if you look down towards the bottom of the boiler, you can't see the lining come to an end. It just sort of continues on very, very neatly, which is great. The splashes, while they might not have been glued on properly, they are nicely lined, as is the running plate. Can't really fault the lining at all, to be honest with you. The side of the cab is also nicely lined and it has the classification and running number there, 46165, all very nicely applied. Let's do a little section on the cab then, because the cab's not too bad, I would say. So it's reasonably nicely glazed. The glazing pieces are a little bit messy in places, but overall they look quite nice. The roof of the cab is detailed with lots of rivets, as well as this moving air intake on top. I mean, that's the kind of feature you'd expect on such an expensive loco. The cab itself has got the doors pre-fitted, which look really, really good, and they don't seem too fragile either, and I can't see glue all over them, so that's quite impressive. You've got the tender full plate pre-fitted, although it's nowhere near the tender, so it's a little bit pointless, really. The cab detail is okay. There's very few colours used. The gauges have been picked out, which is great, but you don't have those sort of ultra-realistic water gauges or anything like that, but it's not too bad. It's not too bad. It's a reasonably enclosed cab, so I'm not complaining too much there. Okay, let's see what else we've got in terms of decoration. You've got the tiny warning signs, which suggests that this is a preservation loco. Obviously, those are there to warn you about the overhead electric lines. I don't think they had to warn people about that back in the sort of late BR era. So yeah, that's my guess anyway. But those are nicely applied. The cylinders are nicely lined. You've got on the smoke box door here, you've got the running number and the shed code nicely applied. You've also got a metal handrail and the separately fitted smoke box dart, which unlike the lamp irons have been fitted quite nicely. As per the real Royal Scots, the buffer beam detail is very, very minimal. However, you do have these metal buffers which are sprung, which is quite nice to see like that. And look at the smoke deflectors. They've got quite an unusual shape to them, haven't they? They're actually quite tiny, very small smoke deflectors. So that's interesting. I quite like that. Let's take a look at the wheel set then. Now, the axles are kind of visible. They don't have the fully moulded wheel inserts like some modern locos do, but the axles have at least been painted over so that you can't see them too clearly. So that's all right, I would say. Underneath the cab you've got the little painted pipe work as well as the speedo here which is nicely separately fitted a little bit on the wonk hopefully that won't come off and break <laughs> fingers crossed it won't and then just above there on the running plate as you can see lots and lots of details most of it fitted quite badly with glue marks visible but i suppose props to hornby for actually having those details there so yeah it's not all bad news Let's take a look at the tender then, which is a much more simple model and therefore it's not suffered quite so much from the port assembly. So the decoration is fine. As you can see, the lining looks okay with the exception of the top left corner there, which has got some ugly paint spattering going on there, which is a bit of a shame because otherwise the decoration was excellent. Nothing wrong with the crest though, that looks fine. The underframe is okay as well, mostly moulded detail there, but I guess it would look better with the brake rigging fitted. Up in the top, you've got this removable coal load, which is nice and fine, very realistic in fact. Can't imagine many people wanting to replace that with crushed coal or something, so that's pretty good. Around the back, you've actually got some beautiful decoration. You've got the various plates there, one's probably a builder's plate, the other one was probably about the capacity of the tender, I had to guess, I can't actually read them from where I'm sitting. 
but the way they've been molded is quite clever. They stand very slightly proud from the body of the tender, which just makes them look like they're separately fitted or something. I don't think they are, but the effect there is quite impressive. That's pretty clever. The buffer beam slightly more detailed than on the Loco, as you can see with some riveting going on there and also the coupling hook pre-fitted. And then you've got the metal sprung buffers as well, which is great. And on the back, you've got the pre-fitted NEM coupling there. I think you can fit one to the front if you wanted to, although you'd have to remove that chain link coupling that's on the buffer beam. It's nice to see that though. It's nice that we've got the chain link. Uh, but yeah, I think that would be in the way if you wanted to fit the front coupling. All right, there we go then. So, I mean, overall, the level of detail is a massive thumbs up. The quality leaves a lot to be desired. I think if it was assembled a bit more carefully, I could have been a lot more impressed with this. However, let's take a look at the mechanism. There's still chance for this model to redeem itself. Fingers crossed that it will. So there she is then, Hornby's beautiful Royal Scot down onto the track, ready for her first test. First of all though, a word about the mechanism. Now I would describe the mechanism as okay. It's certainly better than Backman's 460 offerings, but it's not quite up to Hornby's usual standard. First of all then, if you remove the base keeper plate of the Loco, you can see that the pickup assembly has been hardwired in, as opposed to using those spring-loaded contacts, which makes the removal of the pickups for cleaning and maintenance very easy. Yeah, unfortunately, there's no way to access the pickups with this. Makes the Loco much, much cheaper to produce, of course. Far fewer parts involved. Again, the RRP is incredibly puzzling there. Now, speaking of body removal, the instructions completely fail to mention the fact that you actually have to remove the Speedo assembly here in order to remove the body. So if you follow the instructions to the letter, you will tear that off and destroy it. The instructions exist to point things out like this. The fact that they don't is completely useless. How embarrassing that is. Now inside you can see the chunky chassis. We do have a nice chunky five pole motor too, but there's no flywheel or anything like that. So again, for a very, very expensive model, it is just falling short in this area as well. However, the number of pickups is really good. So you've got all of the driving wheels picking up, despite the fact that it's very difficult to disassemble it and clean those pickups. And also the tender picks up as well. So that's really good. Yeah, the, the mechanism's okay, but it's not quite up to Hornby's usual standard, I would say that. You can tell that this is an older mechanism why has it got such a high price? Don't get it. Right, let's give it a test though. Maybe the performance itself will redeem it. Now I keep saying this is from 2007. I should say this version, my model, was not made in 2007. It's the design that dates back to 2007. This model is still in Hornby's range today, so it's not been sitting on a shelf for 13 years. I don't know how long this one has been sitting on its shelf, but it has not yet been run in, so don't draw any conclusions yet until it has been run in. I certainly won't do that, but out of the box, just for interest, here we go. Let's turn it up slowly, see what this baby can do. Can't see any movement. Oh, oh, I saw the centre wheels take up the slack there. Are we crawling? Yeah, sort of. Are we going? Yeah, that's good. That is really good. Look at that. Now, please say this is going to be smooth at the high speeds as well, because I've seen quite a bit of that lately. Amazing crawls, and then they run like dogs at higher speeds. I don't understand how that happens. Go on then. Yeah, it's, it's a noisy old one. All right, okay, well, yeah, maybe that's not too bad. It sounds like there's, it sounds noisy. Um, it's not like a motor noise, it's just, it sounds like a lot of parts moving <laughs> noise, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's almost a bit rattly, isn't it? It's all right though, yeah, I mean, it looks really good. It looks really good and smooth. It's just maybe the sound's distracting. Yeah, no, I think I can live with that. I think I can live with that, as long as stuff's not clicking. I hope it isn't. The lack of flywheel could make this a less smooth loco, and certainly if I just cut the power. Actually, that's not bad. That didn't actually lock up like some locos without flywheels do which tells me that the armature must be quite substantial on this because it's it's got some inertia to it, hasn't it? Right, let's try that let's try that crawl again, shall we? I mean, I can go slow over the express points and I know that. Dead zones right here, just there. I know it's not going to stop. It doesn't look very happy, but it's not going to stop because it's got loads of pickups. Yeah, that's not great. Look at that. I'm not touching the controller. It's speeding up, slowing down quite a bit. Hopefully this is not going to be one of those dodgy runners. Yeah, oh, we are, is it stalled there? Give it a little push. 
yeah, I don't know about you folks, it's just not dreadfully, not dreadfully impressive. Um, no doubt it's going to get much better. Like I say, don't draw any conclusions just yet. Um, and it's not as though you can just oil the bearings on this because they've designed it so that you actually have to fully dismantle the thing in order to be able to do that and loosen off those wires so you can pull the pickup plate out. I'm not willing to do that with a brand new model. I might ruin it. And then what do I do? No, can't do that. But it seems all right. I mean, it's it's OK. Maybe it will be much better having been run in. I'm, I'm really counting on that. And that crawl, here we are. The crawl is actually really good. The crawl is the best aspect of this so far. Look at that. Right, let's get it going on its own then. Let's see how it handles the layout. 50% speed. So it does seem to be geared to run quite fast, which suggests that there could be a bit of a torque issue at the low speeds. That might explain why the speed fluctuates the way that it does at lower speeds. But uh, yeah, we will see, we will see. So I'll let this run in, let's say 25 minutes in each direction. We'll come back after that and see if it's any better. Please, please, please let it be better. Please. Okay, folks, running in has concluded. Right, so, I mean, the smoothness, the noise, that's all gotten a lot better. Haven't seen any derailments or anything like that. So, I mean, the performance is quite good. One thing is still true, though, and that is that this Loco is too damn fast. In order to get it to trundle along at this speed, I had to set my Gauge Master controller down to 20. 20! Most Locos run comfortably at 50% speed and they look good. This at 50% speed looks far too fast. And the knock-on effect there is that at 20, my Gauge Master controller only puts out 4 volts. At 50% speed, it puts out 10 volts, which means in order to get this to run comfortably at a lower speed, the Loco is having to run on incredibly low power. That's going to amplify the voltage drop and it's going to seriously reduce the amount of torque in the mechanism. Just for the record though, around the dreaded curves, the second radius there, it is not slowing down too much without a load. It actually handled that surprisingly well, which means that if I couple it up to these coaches and then it does struggle, we know it's nothing to do with the gauging or friction in the mechanism, we know it's down to a pure lack of torque. Even on DCC, this will be a problem. You want your locos to utilize the entire spectrum of speed that any control system can offer, rather than just the first 40 odd percent of it, because this is too fast at 50% speed, look. That is too quick. I would say that is getting close to the real life maximum speed that this thing would want to be running at. And you've still got 50% more speed to add to that. So let me run past at full speed just to show you what that looks like. It's probably quite silly. Are you ready? It's just way too quick. So yeah, I mean, that is probably my only criticism. And it completely explains why the low speed performance is a little bit dodgy. But is it? I mean, the crawl before was okay, if a little bit inconsistent. Uh, it was pretty slow though. So let's see if that is any better. So forwards we go, turning up real slow. There we go. And look at that, that's pretty good. Now I can guarantee there's basically no torque there, so if I put my fingers on the buffers, it's probably not going to be wheel slipping, is it? Because there's absolutely no torque. Yeah, stopped it dead. Let go, it starts again. That's probably true of the slightly higher speeds as well. Yep, look at that. Stopped dead. Let go, it goes again. Stopped dead. No torque, no torque whatsoever. It's, it's kicking in at ridiculously low speeds, which is impressive, actually, given the gearing. There must be good motors. I'll give it that. Higher speed. Yeah, I mean, that's smooth. That's not speeding up and slowing down so much, is it? Backwards. Hmm, still a little bit. But it's okay, it's better than it was. It's not the best crawler because it's so inconsistent, but it's not cutting out because of all the pickups and it is reasonably slow, so that's not too bad. Right, let's go and couple to some coaches then and see how it gets on. Okay, let's see if the couplings are at the correct height. These are sort of old Lima coaches, so it's not 100% fair, but we'll see if that worked, hopefully it did. Right, let's test my theory then. I'm gonna set it up to 20% speed and see if the Loco handles those curves as well as it did alone, but with seven coaches coupled to it. Let's try it, here we go. Good luck, Royal Scott, we're counting on you. There we go. I mean, that is like a heritage railway speed and as a preserved Loco, I think, it's quite important that it can do this well. Gone and got another loco parts there now, so apologies. All right. Ooh, wow. 
So actually, that is a lot better than expected. Very good. Now, the voltage drop isn't killing it too badly. It does seem like it is slowing down now. But that's because it's kind of right at the midpoint. Ah, yeah. So that's it. If that was running, in fact, I can prove this to you. If I now run it up to, say, 40 or 50% speed, you won't see such a slowdown because the voltage drop is less. Like I say, if you do the maths, 10 volts versus 4 volts, the voltage drop at 10 volts is going to be far less significant than just 4 volts. Let's try that. So here we go, this is 40% speed, and to be honest, even this is at the top end of what you'd want to be running this at. It looks a bit fast, even at this. But as you can see, it really doesn't care about the hill anymore. So there we go. So if it was geared correctly, I could set it to 40% speed, and the loco would run much slower, yet it would be less affected by gradients and curves. And that is what the problem is with this loco. Right, let's compromise then. Let's set it at 30. That's slow enough for me, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, that is kind of... I would say that was 50 speed if I could not look at the controller on a normal loco. Anyway, let me show you what we're up against then. So here is the mainline Royal Scott. This was the first loco I ever reviewed. i got to say the Hornby looks a lot better than this one, that's for sure. And I'm 90% sure that the armature in the motor here has had it. I need to swap it really. So it is going to stop running at some point. And I have, well, it's kind of the opposite problem to Hornby's. I'm having to turn the controller right up. That's 50% speed. <laughs> yeah, it's not happy, but I thought it's my first Royal Scott review in seven or eight years. I'm going to do this. So off it goes, sort of. And there you are. And then we have a similar loco, but from Backman coming in at 50% speed. This is 50% speed. You see the difference there? Now the mechanism in this loco, this is the Patriot by the way, Blackman's mechanism is far worse. The level of detail isn't quite there. However, the actual finish and build quality on this model is better than Hornby's Royal Scott, it must be said. Just the way that the loco looks from a distance is better. And actually, I don't know if it quite runs better, but as far as speed goes, it's a lot more compelling, isn't it? Much more realistic. So there we go. Enjoy the running session. Better film the main line now, because it's going to get tired, I can guarantee it. Even now, going up this hill, you can see it's struggling. There we go. Yeah, not my favourite mechanism, that main line one. Hornby's is at least much better than that. I mean, the mechanism's above average in this Hornby Scott, definitely. And I think it would show if the gearing was better, but alas not. Overall, not a terrible performer, though. Overall, though, I mean, it looks great while it's running. It's just such a shame about those quality problems, because besides that, it is a beauty, definitely. Mm. There we are, folks. I think we've about had it. I'm just pushing her in now. This is uh, a mainline Royal Scott. This is what happens. I think the armature just gets warm and decides it doesn't want to go anymore. I've got some, some more armatures for them, actually, so I might uh, swap it out one day. But, yeah, oh, it's trying. <laughs> but I, I reckon I will... Uh... No, that's definitely had it. I'll swap it then for another engine. So say goodbye to the mainline Royal Scott, <laughs> which is now cooking. Right then, let's go with the Hornby Patriot, shall we? Other Patriot on the line. See what other engines you can spot on the layout today, by the way. There are quite a few for you to look at. Right, I think we're about ready. Take it away then, Hornby Patriot. So let me know down in the comments then, is this worth 170 or 150 pounds? Those are the RRP and the retailer price, typical retailer price. Pulling power's all right though, look at that. It's because it's heavy, it's pretty heavy. Pulling power, definitely not bad. So here are some of my ratings then for Hornby's lovely Royal Scott locomotive. The level of detail then, I've thought about this, it's a conundrum, but on balance I have decided to give this five star. Some elements such as the cab, maybe we've seen better cabs elsewhere, but generally speaking the level of detail has to be applauded. You've got the etch name plates, you've got all those metal safety valves and the metal reverser rod. Yeah, a lot of the details are really, really nice. To say this is 13 years old, I'm very impressed with that. 
the performance then, I think I've been quite generous here, if anything. I've given it four star. Before running in, I think it would have been more like a three star, but now that it's running, it is a little bit smoother and it does crawl a little bit better. However, the slow speed isn't dreadfully consistent because of the gearing. It just runs far too fast, which means you're having to turn the controller down in order to get a realistic speed out of it. I don't know why Hornbeat gear low coats like this, they're not toys, they're supposed to be for adult collectors, they're not supposed to run along like this, and having to turn the controller down to 20% means that you're really limiting the amount of power the Loco's got on offer, and that's not on. Besides that though, yeah, it's nice and smooth now, reasonably quiet too, it's gotten quieter, yeah, the performance is okay. The pulling power then isn't too bad, I measured 24 coaches, tractive effort of 0.39 newtons. That's more than Hornby's 4MT, also a 460, but it's less than the Bachmann Stanier Mogul, less than the Bachmann N-Class. Even Hornby's 4P tank engine is more powerful than this. So it's about average, it's not particularly great, not terrible either, I've given it middle of the road there. The mechanism then isn't one of Hornby's best. I've definitely seen worse from other manufacturers, but I've certainly seen better from Hornby. So I really like the fact that it has a lot of pickups, particularly in the tender as well. Five pole motor is really quite good. Downside soap, the gearing, that is very silly. Lack of flywheel, that's unfortunate. And also the poor access to the axles and the chassis. Hardwired pickups are a thing of the past now. That's quite an outdated feature. Not something you'd expect on a 170 pound model. That brings us on to the quality then. I've given it 2.5 on quality, which is a real shame. So we've got glue marks, very visible. Quite a few of the separately fitted parts were misfitted very clumsily, so that's not great either. Also, for a model that costs £170 RRP, there's too much plastic here. The body, the running plate, everything on the Loco besides the chassis is made of plastic. I think for the price that ought to have been better as well. On the plus side though, there are lots of pluses with the quality. The model's still very heavy at 371 grams. The decoration's really good. Some of the details are made of metal and the mechanism's okay as well. So I've given it right in the middle, 2.5. Value for money, £170.99 or £144 at the retailers seems a little bit too much for a model with features such as this. If it was going to cost £170, you'd want some more die cast, you'd want that flywheel, you'd want the performance to be top notch. Unfortunately, this is too old and outdated to cost that much, and it does show, unfortunately, Hornby. Overall then, that is not a bad score, could have been better, 6.81 out of 10. If I'd have been able to give this a 5 star on quality, it would have been more like a 7 or 8 out of 10. I did punch those numbers in. As it is though, let's put it into the logbook. Let's see, 34th, just above the Dapol Great Western Railcar and below the Hornby Dean Single. Of course, it's much better than the Hornby Dean Single, but it's also much more expensive and the quality is far poorer. So there you have it then folks, overall a lovely lovely loco, very well detailed, just let down by a silly price and poor quality. So I can't really recommend this unless you can find it for £100 or less. If you can't then go for it, it's worth it. Some of these issues are much better if you've only paid £100 for them. 170 or 150 not a chance, not in my opinion. Going back to what I said at the start, high prices from Hornby are fine as long as the model matches the price tag, so J36 go and check out that review. That's an example of a model that does match the price tag, in my opinion. This one, though, sadly not. And there's the Backman Patriot. My opinion, though, of course, if you, if you think that it does actually justify the massive price, that is fine. Let me know if you think that and why. There you have it then, folks. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed this review. Uh, that has at least settled my curiosity now on these Hornby Royal Scots. I've wondered about these for years, and now I know. <laughs> and yet, I guess my suspicions were more or less correct. But there we go. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. As I say, I will see you on the next one. But until then, you look after yourselves, and hopefully I'll be back pretty soon. All right. Cheers, folks. Take care.